Support for the Dice Tower comes from listeners like you and from the Op, also known as USAopoly. Thanks for your support. Oh, hey, future Eric here. Happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy New Year. Whatever you may be celebrating this time of year, I hope you have are having a wonderful time doing so. A uh, quick note about today's episode. This is a little different from our usual end of the year wrap up. Uh, we decided to add this together with our Winter Spectacular, which was a, a series of video stuff that we were doing on the Dice Tower channel. And uh, since we were getting everyone together to do one of these group top tens, uh, myself and Mandy and Suzanne and also Ella Ampanion uh, from Ella Loves Board Games, we were all together and, and decided let's just use the audio from that to, uh, to present our, our top ten. Now, the, this is a couple of things. Um, One, uh, the audio is a little bit different from what you are used to hearing uh, in the podcast because it was recorded off of the the many video feeds that we put it all together. I've tweaked it a little, and and it should all be legible, but um, something about me being the host of the whole thing makes me louder than the others, and we're we're still fiddling with with those levels. The other is that, well, Tom's missing. Um, I mean, that might be a plus or a minus. I'm not sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. We will discuss Tom's top 10 of the year uh, coming up in future episodes. You can also see his top 10 with the other guys on video as part of the uh, Winter Spectacular. Just search for uh, Dice Tower Winter Spectacular or Top 10 of 2020, and you should get his picks as well. Without further ado, uh, let's, let's get started with The Dice Tower, episode 689. Our top 10 games of 2020. Hello and welcome to the Dice Tower's Winter Spectacular and a simulcast with the Dice Tower podcast. I'm Eric Summerer and joining me, let's go clockwise, we have Mandy Hutchinson. Hello, hello, hello. We have Ella. Hi. Joining us all the way from Australia. Good. <laughs> and Suzanne is in the center square position. Actually not, the, uh, the lower oh, so left sure. hand... Uh, we, so we, we I, need. If I go like this, am I poking you, Eric? You are indeed poking at me. <laughs> yes. If if you do that, uh, so we are here <laughs> to to go through our top ten of 2020, uh, which I'm very excited to do, and I'm very excited to have all of you uh, with me. And for all of you who have tuned in in the live broadcast. Thank you for joining in for the spectacular, and uh, you can feel free to chat along with us as uh, as we go through our top ten. But we should, at the very least, address uh, how different a year this has been, and how it's been uh, tricky for us to to play our games. So uh, let let's real quick go go around uh, around the horn and and talk about how we've been able to get gaming to happen this year, and uh, and how it's been different for us. Uh, Mandy, why don't you go first? Oh, sure. So this has been rough for me because I still, we're you know not really supposed to be leaving our houses. Um, this is probably the most time I've spent with Suzanne Gaming. And we do not even <laughs> live in the same country because we have been playing virtually. Like we have become very creative in finding ways to play physical board games virtually. You know, the Tabletopia, TTS, apps, all sorts of ways to get games played. I do find that the heavier games are being left off the table, (laughs) literally left off the table, um, because uh, just with the situation, it's really hard to get those heavier games in. So just a lot of creativity with technology. (laughs) Ella, how about you? Uh, Pretty much the same. We were on a hard, hard lockdown. Um, Like, I don't even remember. What is time? But we had a hard (laughs) lockdown. Um, And so nobody could visit. You could only travel five kilometers from your house only for four reasons and things like that. So a lot of the heavy games have not been played. Like everybody is shouting at me to play Tekenyu, but I have not. So yeah, most of the time I do play like digitally with people, which is good also because I think a lot of the publishers provided digital version of games that I would not have played if they were not online. So that was pretty cool. Like earlier um, copies. Yeah. Yeah. Suzanne? 
Yeah, and obviously, like Mandy said, I'm, I'm playing a lot of games with her, and we've gotten very creative in terms of webcam usage with physical games. And like Ella saying, things like Tabletopia and TTS have been absolutely vital, and I've played so much there. Of course, I've been playing board game apps for a long, long time, and so it was it was kind of a natural transition or just escalation of patterns that I had before. But I'm, I'm so grateful to publishers that have managed to make that available. And it's one of those things, it's not like it's just, oh, sneeze and you can put your game on digital. I've heard, I've seen some commentary of like, well, why isn't this game on or why isn't that? And it's not, it, it, there's there's some skill and work and effort that goes into getting games up onto these yeah. platforms. So I, yeah. I'm sympathetic to publishers who haven't been able to get their games up on, you know, TTS or Tabletopia or some other platform. But I'm really grateful to those who have because that's been a lifesaver on, on so many ways this year, for sure. Uh, I've had uh, certainly different issues, same issues, uh, and, and doing the, the digital versions has helped. I was able to play some games with my brother out in California, uh, which is pretty cool. And um, my kids have been my chief outlet for playing games, which does sort of skew the games yeah. that we've been able to play. Uh, so right. if anything that, that my nine-year-old has not been able to handle hasn't hit the table uh, as, as much as... Um, as other things. And, and so there are certainly some gaps. Like I, I ran out and, and bought Pandemic Season Zero uh, immediately. I had it pre-ordered at my FLGS and it hasn't been played yet by the family because, you know, we just haven't mm. managed to get it to the table. So that's the sort of situation that I've been in. Um, it, it's tricky, but, but we should we should probably get into the numbers. What do you think? Yeah, sure. All right. That's what everybody's here to see. Everyone's here. <laughs> yeah. All hi, right. everyone, by the way. Everybody's saying hi. Yeah. Say hello, hello. Let's do it. <laughs> Number 10. Number 10 for me is Back to the Future Dice Through Time. There were multiple Back to the Future games uh, that hit, and I haven't played them all. Uh, this is the cooperative dice rolling uh, adventure. I, I like how you, you sort of, it's a pick up and deliver thing through time. Uh, you've got lots of items that have been scattered through different timelines, and uh, you have to get the items to their proper locations through the use of dice symbols and passing dice to your teammates and working together to try and get the timeline back up and running. And the, the theme is pretty cool with the different events being events from the movie trilogy. Uh, so that, that's, that's a good time. Number 10, Back to the Future, Dice Through Time. That looks like a fun one. That's one I want to try. Lots of dice. Looks fun. I mean, come on. It's Back to the Future. Who doesn't love Back to the Future? P.S. They've been rerunning on TV for the past week, so good time to catch up. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Wow. I just uh, totally sat there like, who's next? Oh, it's me. <laughs> it's you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So my number 10. Let's pop it up here so you can see. Gudetama. Ooh, so geez. Gudetama, the lazy tricky egg card game i don't know this was it's funny this was so new to me um just pull it down so i can see you all and it's so cute and can i tell you i think i mostly like this game because it's cute i have yet to receive my physical copy but i've been playing it um online or you know people that have the copy and uh mm -hmm. it's one of those games where i think the card art for me the gameplay is good <laughs> But the card art kind of outweighs the gameplay a little bit because it's just so darn cute. So for me, that that was an easy number 10. It's cute. It makes me happy. I love it. And I know, Suzanne, I know you enjoyed this one as well when we played. Absolutely. It's it's super fun. And those eggs are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's me. My number 10 is Master Word. Great. So for those of you who are my age, you will remember a game called Mastermind. So <laughs> this is that game, but with words. So a guide has a secret word that they know, and they give you a theme as a clue. And you're trying to figure out what that word is by giving clues. Say the theme that they've given is famous person. You're giving the, uh, you're going to give clues like they're alive, they're a movie star, and you're writing it down on pieces of paper. The twist is the guide can tell you which clue is exactly correct they're just going to tell you that you have three clues correct so it's very much like mastermind where you're deducing what that word is in the end it's and it's not that's not the best part of the game the best part of the game is what words come out of your friend's mouths and how they explain certain things which is hilarious so i've really really had a lot of fun with this game so mastermind number 10 master 
Word. Master word. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. the game too. Yeah, that's a... Bringing All our right. own classic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My number 10 is Imperial Spells and Steam. Just like Eric, this is a pick up and deliver game. Maybe a little higher up on oh, the complexity a side little deeper, of, yeah. of, of the game mechanisms <laughs> yeah. point, of, point of view. But this is a pick up and deliver game and an action rondelle game in a way where you kind of get to create your action rondelle as you go because it's it looks like a train and train cars are the actions that you can gain to add to your train. So every time you go down your train, you can kind of cater and customize that move so that you can put out trains on the board and gather up resources and deliver them to the magical cities that want them. Because it's set in the level 99 games world with the, the same thing with, oh, which of course now I can't remember the name of the worker placement game. Argent? Nope, it's not going to come to me. What was it? <laughs> Argent? Are you talking about Argent? Argent, thank you. Yes, yes. Argent. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. One of my favorites. It's in the same world. It's got magic, which is super funny because thematically it kind of hand waves away some of the things like, why can I deliver from way over here to way over here? It's magic. It just works. But it's a really fun pick up and deliver action selection kind of mix. And I've had a lot of fun with it. So Imperial Spells and Steam. This was this was one that uh, was a casualty of the pandemic lockdown. I had a copy ready to go to game night just as we canceled game night. Um, so it's one I really want to try, and I'm glad glad you liked it. Number nine. All right, my number nine is Gudetama, the tricky egg oh, card game. Okay. So. That's our first crossover with Mandy. Uh, what I really like about this is the, how it's it's sort of it's a trick taking card game that is focused totally on the final trick. So how you manipulate everything to go into that final trick is tricky, <laughs> and I, I find that to be fascinating and and different from many other trick taking games. That's why it's my number nine, Gudetama. Very good selection. <laughs> of course you'd say that. <laughs> All right, class. <laughs> All right, so my number nine, this was a surprising one for me. Okay, so yes, here we go. We're starting yeah. into the space theme, space the search space. for Planet X. So I actually was quite surprised that I liked this game. Well, because it's space and everybody knows how much I complain about space games, but this one was different because it has that deduction element. You're trying to find planet x okay i see you rolling your eyes there suzanne whoa 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 <laughs> so oh, no, I'm on camera. Find... no i know right i never did see it but you're trying to find planet x and it's you know you have that shape of the planet you're trying to make your way around and you're also trying to um discover areas of the planet to get points so for me this one i like the way it made the brain burn so the space theme yeah i could live with it because the game was so interesting and fun and for those who listen to the podcast this is one of ashley the shark's favorite games <laughs> So the search for Planet X is my number nine. She's going to hate that I said that. <laughs> is this the one with the tech trees? The search for Planet X? Or am I thinking of another space no, game? No, that might be no, Pulsar one, 2849. Yes, Pulsar, similar kind of look, I guess. But yeah. Okay. And, uh, okay. Is it me? Yes, it's me. Yes. So my number nine is, um, speaking of cute, um, Fort. So I love a good deck building game. And... Fort has a great mechanic where you can play a single card during a turn, but if you have the right suit, you can play more cards and it actually strengthens your action. So you can, you can build your fort more, or you gather more pizza or, or toys. And I love that there's a private action, but um, there's like this excitement of, ooh, somebody played a public action that I can follow and I have the right suit. So if I play this card, I can do more things. So that actually uh, lifts the game up from other deck builders that I played. And so it's so good. And the theme is so lovely, like, who doesn't like building forts and having kids come over eating pizza? So that was my number nine. Fort. I see Suzanne's very excited for the next yeah, one. I yeah, I know. Just throwing up your image. Slip. My fingers <laughs> lift. Uh, my number nine, in case you, well, I mean, you know, didn't see it there. My number nine is 100 Tori from Pencil First Games. This is a tile laying game with art by Vincent Dutre, which instantly is going to get me 
excited about a game because his art is always just so beautiful. But it's a tile laying game that brought some nice elements to a formula that really worked in terms of how you scored and in terms of how the pathing worked and the timing of where you laid the tiles. All of it came together in just a really beautiful package. Tile laying games with square tiles are fairly common in the industry, but I think the 100 Toy really managed to do something a little different that amped up the experience for me, and I just love it. So that is my number nine, the 100 Toy. Still need to play this one. COVID hit, and that was on the show, so. Yeah, I I, I want to try it too. <laughs> you realize how many games you haven't played, oh my goodness. <laughs> yes, yeah. indeed. I'm, I'm writing down a list right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> My number eight is Control, which is spelled C-T-R-L. Uh, it is a uh, sort of an area control game in a 3D uh, block object. Uh, it's you're, you're building sort of strings of these colored pieces and then placing flags to block off sections of this cube that you're building around and you're building up and around other people. And um, it, it's it's kind of cool. And, and if you're playing with fewer than four players... Um, there's sort of a secret element of which color you are. Um, so you can sort of bluff your way around um, and and pretend that you are other colors. It's um, it's an interesting twist, uh, a little fiddly, like physically fiddly as you're trying to manipulate the pieces. So uh, when playing with kids, I would often have trouble with my son trying to um, do something. He'd be like, I want to put the piece here, but it was physically difficult for him to do so. And it's not intended as a dexterity game. Right. But once you sort of get the finesse of it all, uh, control is is an interesting twist on area control. And my number eight. Yeah, that's another one on, on, on the pile. I desperately want to play. So thanks, Eric, for Writing talking about yeah. it. <laughs> all right. So my number eight. Well, Super Skill Pinball 4K. Oh, another one I, I want to play. So good. Yeah. I am obsessed. Okay, first of all, I'm obsessed with pinball. So, of course, that was going to be on my list. And it literally is like pinball. I feel like when I'm playing it, so I don't know if anybody plays pinball in the chat or here. Mm -hmm. I, you don't understand. I'm one of those people, like, when I play, I'm, like, bumping the table to get the, you know, the ball to go the right place. And I feel like I want to do that because the theme comes through so well in this. You know, you've got your flippers. That's and amazing. You know, so you know if you hit this flipper, it's going to go up here on the sheet and, you know, hit some bumpers. And, like, it all flows like a pinball game, like an actual pinball game would go. It is a little bit on the long side, but I don't even care because the theme comes through and it's something that I really enjoy. And it comes with different sets of sheets. So I was able, I've been able to play through a few of them the hacker one was actually really really good so you have a chance to try that one i really enjoyed it so uh yeah super skill pinball for kate it is quite the title <laughs> <laughs> it is my my number eight is zombie teen so this was um i always well, i didn't want to play this because it was a well i thought it was a kid's game it is can be a kid's game but it can be great for adults also. So this is actually a sequel to Zombie Kids, which I played through like in a day because this was so good. Um, so this is a cooperative game where you're trying to get rid of zombies in your town. They've gone out of the school. They're now in the town and trying to eat you. So you have very simple decisions to make. So either move, pass a thing, or kill a zombie. So it's a quick co-op, simple decisions, but it's still a big game because the game throws a lot of um, curve, curve balls. Is that the term? Because I don't know. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you got it. You got it. You got it. <laughs> so curveball because um, I can't I can't spoil it because you open these envelopes that give a lot of things that improve the game, change things up, and I won't even say what they are. But unlocking those envelopes was very very exciting, and I kind of like this better. Oh, the, people are gonna not like this, but I liked it better than Pandemic Season Zero because it was so short. I'm like even if I lost, I didn't feel. I know. Ooh, no. <laughs> Suzanne is angry at me. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna get hate. But yeah, because it was so quick, um, you could play so many games, and I like that it was. I, it, I was quick to see what the changes were, so that was pretty cool. Yeah, so that was Zombie Teens for number eight. Great. Before and... Suzanne goes, I just have to say, I noticed in the chat about me striking first with the first roll and right, but I feel like Suzanne may have more to come. So <laughs> give it time, everyone. <laughs> Well, let's talk about striking first, because I did not pick the order in which we were going. And my number eight. Oh, no. oh, 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 up, oh, sister. Oh, 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 oh,
Catskill Pinball 4K. That's right. For everything that Mandy said, I don't need to dwell on it. I love the thematic nature of it. I like the variety that is in the box. And I just have fun playing it. It plays great solo and it plays great with multiple people at the same time too. So there's just a lot of value in the game and it's a ton of fun. So my number eight, Super Skill Pinball 4K. This is on my Christmas list. I want a copy of that one. Eat it, Eric. It's Eat a good it. one. Your life. Number seven. Number seven is a cooperative game about endangered species called Endangered. Uh, you are trying to protect different uh, species of, of animals, and you have to sort of manage the fires on the board uh, by, by keeping the animals safe, but also persuade various, uh, it's sort of like a United Nations thing, persuade different voters to vote for your environmental initiative. So it all depends, there's sort of like tipping points for each of these um, voters, and so you have to maybe have a certain number of animals on the board, or have certain clusters on the board, or collect a certain variety of cards in order to convince these voters to vote yes on your initiative. And that is ultimately the 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 end game condition, the win condition. Uh, and that is a difficult balance, managing the fires on the board, sometimes literally, and going for the voting members of the team. And that's the trick with Endangered. I, I've only played the initial two animals. I would like to play more. I know there's an expansion on the way. And that's my number seven, Endangered. Good choice. That is one that I've been wanting to play for a really long time, so I'm glad to hear that it made your list, so now I really have to try and get it played. <laughs> All right, so my number seven is actually a game that I played recently, and it's just beautiful. <laughs> so my number seven is <laughs> bees. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Ella, do you see what I have to put up with in the podcast? Do you see... <laughs> now now let's not be hasty oh so. you're just feeling stung about the whole thing i oh no <laughs> oh, oh puns oh i know I, i'm waiting for the chat to just go off on this but uh, so bees is a game it's cute it's about bees but that's not the only reason why i like it for those who are not aware of how the game plays just a little touch of of that the games uh the game happens where the bees you're on the board you're literally buzzing around trying to collect pollen off the flowers and get them in your you know pollen and honey in your pot so you have your own kind of board where you're going to put that on your board and try to get points that way by completing shapes or objectives um, that you have as well as against public objectives the thing is it's tricky because the bees have kind of set numbers on their base and depending on which direction it's facing will let you know how many spaces you can move so sometimes you want that really juicy you know nectar in the middle there of the flower oh wait my bee doesn't have enough movement or too much movement to get to that part of the board so once you filled up your little slots on your player board the game ends and then you see how many points you've achieved through your objectives and so forth. I really like this. We did a stream of this, Suzanne and I and um, Ashley, another friend of ours. And I mean, I absolutely loved it. The B puns just continue. I, I stopped myself from a pun right there. I'll, you know, I'm not the queen bee of the pun, but you know, we'll just leave it alone. So bees, this is delicious, fun and good. <laughs> <laughs> My number seven is also a cute game, but now we're talking about cats. So my number seven is Calico. So this is a lovely, lovely game where you're building a beautiful quill so that you can attract the best cats. But um, do not be fooled because it's such a brain burner. I remember we had so much AP when I was playing with my friends because the best thing about this thing is solving the puzzle of how do I optimize what uh, tiles I choose and where I place them because you can actually score several objectives if you're very smart and I wasn't <laughs> when I played this game. So the, the games are re uh, sorry, the rules are very simple but it has very meaty decisions so don't be fooled by the theme. It's really like super puzzly and meaty and it was a great game. So number seven, Calico. That's a good good choice. That, that's that very game. good. Great choice. So good. Alright, my number seven is Fire's End. Mm. For those of you who listen to the podcast, you'll know I play a fair amount of solo games, and the pandemic certainly helped me lean into that a little bit. Spire's End is a solo or two-player cooperative game in which 
it's it's just a massive deck of huge cards with great illustrations and you're kind of going through it a little bit like a choose your own adventure book but there are combat roles and there are items and there are branching narrative elements with different endings throughout it i haven't gotten to explore all the endings yet even though i've played it a fair number of times which I think is amazing. And I love the story. I love the art. I like the choices that you get to make. I think that it plays very efficiently and cleanly. It's not super fiddly, which I like in kind of those, oh, I'm tired at night, I want to play a solo game kind of thing. Right. Spires and just hits all of those points beautifully. It's been a ton of fun to explore. And I highly recommend it if you are interested in playing solo games at all. So my number seven... Fires end. Cool. Oh, I want it now. Just the picture alone. I want it. Yeah, it's <laughs> so with old. these top tens. Now we just want all the games. You know, <laughs> yeah. I think when we're done, we should each pick one of the games that that was on someone else's list that is the top of our list to play next. Absolutely. So so yes. keep thinking. It's a great idea. <laughs> Good idea. Number six. Number six, uh, I believe I talked about when I was on the podcast last time with Mandy and Suzanne, and that is Athenium Mystic Library. Uh, this is a game that, that is about shelving books. Um, you you are acquiring these books through various... It has a cool card drafting mechanism uh, where you, you play a card that does something good for you, but also does something good for both of your neighbors. Uh, and so you'll take all of those actions that you've acquired both from your card and from the two cards to your sides and then do what you want to do. And you're shelving these books, trying to complete certain patterns on your shelving board, complete uh, shelving units in order to score points, put candles, decorative candles uh, around your shelving units and eventually earn enough points. It's puzzly for sure. Um, and I like how you can score some objectives and then reshelve the books, move them around uh, to to mm. achieve something else later on, and maybe an end game scoring objective. Um, it has a lot of potential and plays pretty fast. It's only I think ten actions. Yeah, ten actions the entire game, and that's it. Uh, and it, it went well with my kids, and um, I, I'd like to uh, to play it some more. Athenium Mystic Library, my number six. That's a good one. That almost made my list, but I was only able to play it the one time. I need another play, but. That's uh, I love the flavor text in that one. Have you yes. read? Oh, there's the... a lot of wonderful titles in there. Uh, someone in the chat asked, it's not a redo of Ex Libris. It is not, even though that also has some very fun titles in its uh, book library. They are very different games beyond sort of the visual similarity. Absolutely. Well, my number six was definitely played a lot. My City. So Suzanne mm -hmm. can attest to this because we played it. From start to finish, that's a big deal because I don't generally play a lot of, you know, these kind of campaign games or those sorts of things to the end. This one we did. And I think it's probably because it had that polyomino element to it and you were literally trying to build your city and it changes from chapter to chapter. So I don't want to give away too much because it's one of those games, you know, you want to be a little surprised, but you do have some things that hinder your building, some things that help you out. So, And it's one of those games where sometimes winning all the time isn't always good. <laughs> Do you see Suzanne's face? Because there's a story there. <laughs> Anybody who listens to the podcast knows I was keeping them updated. And yes, I lost a lot. But I had a, a resurgence. I still lost, but I still had a really good time doing it. <laughs> and I think it was just I really enjoyed that kind of um, spatial element, even though it's not something I'm particularly good at. And I like the surprises that came out with each chapter. Sorry, that's not a great explanation, but I don't want to give away too much of the story. So uh, my number six is My City. Great choice. <laughs> My number six is Gloomhaven, Jaws of a Lion, which was great during COVID because I played this solo uh, with, oh, how do you call it? Double-handed with two characters. So I oh. played it solo a lot. Oh. I love this game. Yeah. I love this game for so many reasons, but the best thing for me is how well it teaches you how to play Gloomhaven. I've read Gloomhaven, the, the rule book, so many times. I still forget when I'm playing it, like what happens again here. But this one, it holds your hand through, throughout the scenarios and it tells you how to play. And it solves the biggest issue that I had with playing Gloomhaven, which was the setup. 
here you just flip over the book it's the new scenario so that was pretty great and the new characters are awesome the monsters are great the story is great and i um you get to enjoy the puzzle of optimizing how to use your cards but now in an easier more street uh, seamless format so it was just quicker to play so that's why it was number six for me gloomhaven jaws of a lion Oh, that one looks fun, and it looks like a beast. Rawr. That one's, that one's on my list. That one on my end of show list right there. <laughs> Suzanne right. missed that one, by the way. <laughs> okay. Oh, phew. Thank goodness. All right. We're moving on to my number six. My number six is Dinosaurs in Space. Oh, this good. is a uh, card-based roll-and-write game called Demeter, published by Sorry We Are French, and... If you like roll and write games that have just just a tiny bit more complexity, just a tiny bit more depth, and lots and lots of combos, then you will want to check out Demeter. It has a, a row of cards with different types of actions on them that you can pick from every round. You're trying to discover different dinosaur species, hire scientists. There's a tiny, tiny little bit of a tech tree, some set collection, and... Your choices determine what your scoring will be because there are four things that will score, but you have to unlock them in order to score them before the end of the game. It It's devious, and you're going to get into it, and you're going to realize halfway through your game how unprepared you were for the game. And <laughs> it's, it's really impressive. I've thoroughly enjoyed it and definitely deserving on my top 10 list for the year. Demeter, my number six. That right. is a very meaty roll and write. Um, it's excellent. I'm terrible at it, but I own it and I love it. So oh, if you haven't tried it. it out seriously, you need to try it. It's very good. Okay. Great publish your name. <laughs> yes. Sorry, yeah. we are French. <laughs> Aw. Sorry, we are French. <laughs> hey, folks. Today's show is brought to you by the op uh also used as known as usaopoly and today we want to talk a little bit about their featured game hues and cues actually you can watch me play this online if you want with people it's, hues and cues is a game that my whole family really enjoyed playing it's a big board that's just full of just a color swaths all these different colors uh and you are trying to connect colors to words you're going to get a color on a card and then I might say the word apple, or I might say the word, you know, sunny. And you got to, everyone's going to try to pick that color or get close to that color on the board. There's hundreds of color squares. And when I say 480 colors to be exact, what? That is a lot of colors. So green or red, you know, probably red is for apple. But what if I had just eaten a green apple that this morning? Either way, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> and you're using one or two word cues and trying to get people to guess. But you can also get close to the answer and get points. And so it's a lot of fun as everyone will sit there and argue over what color you should have actually said. And it holds a whole pile of people. Uh, very much recommend it. Uh, hues and cues. The perfect gift or a game for your holiday get-togethers. The Op has a game for any type of gamer in your life. So many great games and puzzles. Get hues and cues and many more at theop.games or at your favorite game retailer. Number five. My number five is a game that I bought to play with the children, and that is Marvel United, uh, a cooperative game in the Marvel Universe uh, where you are matching up symbols on cards uh, to complete tasks, defeat bad guys, uh, and you get to do not only the card that you played, but also the symbols on the card that comes before you in this sort of timeline uh, of, of stuff. And, um, and so you can play a good card that then your teammate gets to use as well. It feels like the decks are different for each of the heroes and the villains feel different. And I can't wait for the next wave of stuff to arrive with all the cool extra villains and characters and all that stuff. Um, and, and I'm looking forward to playing a lot more of Marvel United number five. It looks, I know the characters are supposed to look like, but they look so cute. Oh, they're adorable. <laughs> Chibi, so adorable. cute. Yeah, exactly. All right, so my number five was already mentioned, so I won't go into too much detail, but we'll still show the picture anyway. Oh, well, apparently we won't because it decided to take a little divergence it... off the screen, so... <laughs> It's Fort. It decided to move on me. <laughs> oh, uh, Fort. I know you're like, nothing for number five? It's, it's uh, at so nighttime at the Fort. It's 
nighttime at the Ford, apparently. Uh, so this game was mentioned by Ella previously, and for all the reasons she mentioned, it's quite good. Uh, I played this one a lot, and I think we played this mm. one on Tabletop Simulator. I ended up just pulling out the, the game to just get a feel for the cards and that sort of thing, and uh, they're really nice. Just even the actual uh, components of the game are excellent. So Fort, very good. I highly recommend trying it if you have not already. My number five is Spicy, and I got to play this late. It was recommended by a friend who loves card games, and I love a good, simple card game. So this game is like Liar's Dice, but with cards. So during your turn, you're going to play your cards face down, or you pass. Um, so what you will say, so there are different spices in the game, chili, pepper, and wasabi. So you're going to say, say, for example, I'm playing a one wasabi. And the next player has to play the same spice, but a higher number. The thing is, you can lie. You can, you can totally lie, and they have to catch your bluff so that you can take the cards and score them. So it plays really quick, and it's super fun, and it scales really well so i played it with two and then i played it with um all of my family so it's pretty good so and also there are six variants to it so there's a lot of replayability because i looked at the forms they were like this is not replayable no there's six variants so there spicy and the card art you have to look at it it's really wonderful it also has like gold foil which i always appreciate in card games so spicy huh. Very spicy. And sparkly, apparently. <laughs> and sparkly. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Spicy and sparkly. <laughs> like me. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Number five. We're on five, right? That's where we're at. Yes. Right. yes. My number five. Viscounts of the West oh, Kingdom. Excellent choice. Yeah. Mm. I have... <laughs> I have really enjoyed this game for me this whole series or family of games has just gotten better i loved 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 paladins and then viscounts comes up and i'm like well you know paladins was so good well viscounts is just excellent you're moving mm. around the board you're trying to build up a deck and you use these cards with different icons to determine the actions that you're going to take there's some set collection mixed in in there. I love how you can plan your movements. I love how you can think about how you want to build out your deck. There's this castle in the middle where you're moving meeples up and trying to optimize for extra actions there. There's a lot going on, but it doesn't feel too complicated for me, which I really, really enjoy. It hits that sweet, little bit heavier Euro style game that I so, so enjoy. And Viscounts is one of my favorites in that family of games and certainly oh, wow. one of my favorites for 2020. So check that one out. My number five, Viscounts of the West Kingdom. Good choice. Nice I juicy will. game. Mm. <laughs> we need a break after this to play all these games. Indeed. Yeah, right? Yes. Number four. Number four is Isle of Cats for me. Uh, this has a lot of fun things going for it. You have the 2020 game. I I think it was delivered in 2020. Um, I, I went and researched it, uh, and I found enough people. I think Board Game Geek might say it's 2019, and then the first edition has a 2020 date on it. It's one of these weird. Okay. I'm calling it 2020 by gum because I played it in 2020. <laughs> uh, it's got the yes. polyomino laying as you're laying these cat tiles onto your ship. and uh, But it also has like action drafting and turn order manipulation and a resource management economy that you're trying to maintain um, and, and communal scoring events. It's got a lot of really cool things going for it and it all comes together in a nice solid package. Isle of Cats, my number four. So my number four, I feel like I'm going to be hazy on remembering the rules to this game, but I remember I enjoyed it a lot when I played it because <laughs> it's been that long. So my number four is on Mars, and my list cannot be complete without a Vital Lacerda game. So, of course, on Mars. <laughs> now, this is definitely one of his heavier games i found the rules for this one are definitely a little bit more intense and it's literally as it looks on the box you're on a planet you're trying to discover the planet and you have so many actions in this game because you have one side of the board you can do depending on where you're sitting on your kind of line of actions and then there's another side of the board that you can do some actions for and then you have your personal board that you're working actions from that as well trying to uh, it's, I don't know if they're hexes that you're trying to put on the board and you're trying to get your machine to kind of move with those areas to kind of excavate them in order to put more tiles to kind of get 
select areas together to get you more points. You have another track that's on the side that's tracking all of these things as well. I'm not going to go into too much detail because this is a huge game. But there's just so much going on, as there always is with the Fatal game, and uh, it doesn't disappoint. So On Mars for me, big hit. I've been trying to get Suzanne to play it, <laughs> but it's been, uh, I think it was Suzanne. Maybe it was Ashley. What of you two? <laughs> oh, I played it a bunch, and okay. I didn't oh, consider yeah. it a 2020 game. Otherwise, it would have been a my I Googled list. it. I Googled it. 2020. <laughs> So, On Mars for me was my number four. <laughs> Good choice. So, I actually played this um, in Lyricon when, in the distant past when we could travel, and it, it is a very Vitala sort of game. Yeah. So, my number four is Ohanami, another simple but perfect card game. So, you start with a card, uh, sorry, you start with a hand of 10 cards. You choose two cards, then pass. That's it very simple all the fun is in trying to fit those two cards in the columns that are already in your tableau because the cards have to be either higher or lower than what's already there so also there are different uh, the different suits score at different times so there's also that aspect that you have to think about so there's a small decision space but there's like it's very meaty and strategic so very interesting decision so that was my number four ohanami oh suzanne has a great way to play this by the way we play this virtually and if you know the oh, game really? you can imagine how to play it but anyway i will save that for another time but suzanne has a fantastic way to play that i game, need so. to learn <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was it was it was google spreadsheets but it's yeah. very good very good Ohanami also has gorgeous art i mm. also didn't think it was a 2020 game but i'm learning i'm learning as we go this is great well the pandasaurus right. version at least is a 2020 yes game. Yeah, i think um, that's, that's what it did yeah. Like what was available, um, during, like widespread that you can buy in 2020? Because yeah. I've, because I, because it, Nid the Valir would have been in my list, but it's mm -hmm. like technically not available yet in North America. Got it. So Got it. I was sad about that. Got my it. copy of Ohanami arrived about a week ago, and so I, it hasn't made it to the table yet. But I'm, I'm, I'm That's excited. So fun. <laughs> All right, my number four. There's a lot of overlap here, so I'll just get right oh, to no. it. Fort, Fort, there you go. Fort's amazing. I love it. The only thing I will add to what everybody else has said is the art by Kyle Farron. Just absolutely nails it and uh, brings the perfect amount of levity and visual charm to a game that is intelligent and engaging and challenging. And it deserves to be in all of our top 20s, for our top 10s for 2020 for sure. sure. So Fort, my number four. Four for Fort. Four for Fort. Four Excellent for, for, for Oh, nice. <laughs> Very good. Well done. Sure. Four for Fort. <laughs> Number three. Number three for me is Nova Luna. Uh, I adore this game. Uh, this one is a lot of fun. It uses a lot of systems that um, that we've seen in other places. The time track uh, element, the uh, the chaining of tiles that we saw from Corne Van Morsel's game uh, Habitats. Um, but it all comes together in a really nice package. Um, a, a simple, easy to get into uh, game that has a good amount of depth as you're juggling easy to complete goals versus the time that it's going to cost you to get those and vice versa um, and and trying to get those double actions I always love the games that let you if you play it right you can get double actions and occasionally pushing far ahead of everybody else but it's the perfect tile for what you need and it might be worth the risk um, really enjoy Nova Luna my number three that is a good one. I didn't think that was 2020. That would have <laughs> I thought it might be like, what? That's, Nova Luna is so good. I think, that, again, it's the Stronghold version came out in 2020. Oh, that's right. And oh, yeah. it was available at Essen the previous year. That's, yeah, and that's where I got good it job. at Essen. I'm so, so that's glad why you brought it up. <laughs> oh, where are we at? Three? Oh, nine number three is great. I just did, uh, I played this not too long ago with a friend, and that is, let's, uh, Unmatched. Ah. and fog now i wanted to just put unmatched completely but that wouldn't be fair because right. i love them all but that was one that really <laughs> resonated with me i just because i like those characters in games where you can be like a double like you have two personalities or you have a double role or something to that effect and for those who are not familiar with the unmatched games each character that you choose has a deck of cards and each of those characters have abilities that you can use and it's 
Oh, that sounds kind of harsh. It's like a fight to the death. But, well, literally, until someone is out of health, that's how the game ends. <laughs> um, but it's really interesting to see how each deck has its own cool thing that it does. And I've played them and found that the scoring has been really close. Even if you mm. have a character that's, you know, attacks uh, melee versus, you know, range, you would think the range player might have more of an advantage, but no, like it's weighed out nicely uh, that uh, the scores have been really close. So it's come to some really nail biter matches. So Unmatched, Cobble and Fog, that is one of the many that I enjoy of the series. I'm surprised you didn't make so it the Buffy good. set. I haven't played Buffy enough. I've only played Spike. So I want to play more of the characters. That's the only reason why that one wasn't there. But yes, I mean, you it's can't judge it just on Spike. OK, I get it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I am looking forward to playing that because um, I'm in Australia and it's trickling down to us. It takes a while to get the games to get to us. So I'm excited. But now they're coming like in a bunch. So I'm pretty excited. So I have that. <laughs> Looking forward to it. We're number three, right? I shouldn't have yeah. that. Yes, we are. Yeah. I know. There's a lot happening. <laughs> yeah. So my number three is dun, 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 Castles of Tuscany. So um, I wasn't actually going to play this game because I'm a snob, because I love Castles of Burgundy. And how could anything be better than Castles of Burgundy for me? Because it's my favorite game of all time. But this was with the benefit of having a Spiel Digital. I was actually able to play it early. The, um, because of that and a lot of people were able to unlike before like you'd have to wait for it to come from Essen and then to the United States and then to Australia but we played it early so I was pleasantly surprised by this it's a more accessible version it distills everything that you like about Castles of Burgundy but in a simpler form so I actually get it to the table more than Castles of Burgundy I still love it like it's they're very different because of the dice but it's not necessarily less satisfying to play this game but you still get but you still get to put tiles that give you bonuses that make things easy for you. So at the end of the game, you're like, look at the domain I have built, which is still awesome. So it it's just a voice, love. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Look at my domain. It's required. That's my king. Queen Sorry. voice. <laughs> I'm a scary queen, actually. So it's a lovely Euro game to play and one that I recommend if you want like an easy Euro game to teach people. Castles of Tuscany. It's a feld. I mean, I, you can't go wrong with a feld. <laughs> no. Um. Mm. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. My number three uh, has already been on somebody else's list. Search <laughs> oh, for Planet X. I love, love, love deduction games, and I love what I call pure deduction games, in which really the deduction is absolutely the focus and the heart of the game. Uh, so a game like Sleuth, right, is just so fabulous. And Search for Planet X is a really pure deduction game. The only thing I will add to what was previously said is it is app-enabled, and the app allows you to have a scaling difficulty. So you can play the game with people and everybody can play at a different difficulty challenge. When you enter it into your app, you can say how many, it essentially gives you more clues to make oh. it a little bit easier for you to reduce the difficulty for you. So if you're playing with younger players or people who might not be as experienced with the genre of gaming, I love that Search for Planet X allows you to scale the experience within a single game amongst players. I think that's a fabulous detail and it's an excellent game so my number three search for planet x that really important yeah that detail has me wanting to play that with the kids yeah. soon i a hundred percent they can get 12 clues and you can get one uh, or okay. four clues eric and it right. really it's yeah. really great because i was thinking it would be a good fit for the 12 year old um mm -hmm. but maybe the nine-year-old okay. can join in as well if he gets the extra okay i yes good yes and i was corrected before you go i was okay. corrected it is not a space game, astronomy, which makes me feel 10 times right. better about having it on my list. I mean, that's an Earth <laughs> game. It's just you're looking at things yeah, right. in space. Right, so technically I was wrong. Yeah. See? Back there on track. <laughs> Number two. Number two uh, was made a very brief appearance at Spiel in 2019, but it didn't actually get to come out uh, to the world until 2020, and that is Project L. Uh, this is the, the puzzle-solving, engine-building game that I have 
I've just fallen in love with. It is so cool. The the production, those chunky uh, polyomino pieces, the way you, you can draft them and upgrade them and then draft the, the puzzles and do the master action and feel like you're so smart because you got all the right pieces to, to cascade in the way you want and then you get more pieces and it just, it, it becomes so much fun. I almost wish it would go on an extra two or three turns because I'm having so much fun getting that engine churning. Uh, and it's been a success with so many groups uh, of my family and friends. Um, big hit at conventions when we were allowed to do that. I think I played this like half a dozen times at Dice Tower West uh, early in the year and and want to play more as soon as I'm able to show it to more people. Project L, number two. I think you taught me that game eric if i'm not mistaken it's an i taught a lot of people that game it's entirely possible i think at spiel yes um i think it was we were we were all fried after a long day in the booth and we just wanted something generally simple to jump into and this is one that you can understand quickly but doing well takes a little bit more push but you can certainly do it after a full day in the booth yeah it was a good one i really enjoyed so thanks for teaching that one to me sure (laughs) So my number two, well, you know, now we're getting into the heavy stuff here. It was already mentioned on somebody else's list. That would be Viscounts of the West yes. Kingdom. Oh, come, on, come on, you all know it was going to be on the list. There's no surprise here. <laughs> so I won't get into uh, reiterating what Suzanne said. I, I, I have to admit, I wasn't, and I haven't reviewed this one yet because I need to play it again. Architects didn't grab me. And I know it's one that everybody really likes. I think I just played with a group where people were being really mean in the game and that just didn't resonate well with me. Hmm. So when Paladins came out, I was like, there's some redemption. I enjoyed this one. Like Paladin is quite heavy versus Viscounts. It still has a bit of that crunch, but then it kind of scales back a little bit. So you're still getting that weightiness, just not as much as Paladins. And it is slightly, slightly shorter. I say slightly because it still can be kind of long. I like the fact that you can score in different ways because I'm the type of person that I just like to touch on a little bit of everything until I can find something that works for me. So uh, Viscounts of the West Kingdom, my number two. I need to play this now. (laughs) (laughs) I need to play all the games. I'm happy for this list. Yeah, I I haven't actually heard about L, so that's on my list. Oh, yes, yes, yes. My number two is Pan Am. So this was early in the year, I think, that it came out. And it has everything that I need in a game and you need in a game. It has a mix of worker placement and bidding, two of my favorite mechanisms of all time. So also there's a, I like the tension between wanting to grow your airline, but also you have to have Pan Am eat you up so that you score. So there's always like, when do I do that with when do I build my airline and stop doing that so that Pan Am can eat it? So that tension is pretty good. <laughs> also, the bidding is really great. Like I didn't, um, a lot of bidding games I don't like, but this one, because even if you get kicked out, you have other options. It doesn't lock you out. Like it's not very punishing in that way. It's still less optimal, but you don't feel like you're going to cry because you've been outbid by uh, on a spot. So also it's not clunky. Like be, even if there are different mechanisms, it's super smooth. Like you threw those mechanisms together and they mixed really well um and so that was number two pan am pan am (laughs) welcome on board (laughs) uh my number two the red cathedral published by devere games this is a game in which you are the cathedral is represented by cards that you're trying to deliver resources to so that you can complete those sections And in order to do that, you are going to be going around an action rondelle that is dice driven. Those dice will determine how far around the rondelle you can go and how many resources you can get there. It's it's a cake of a game because there are so many layers that you can add on. And literally, there are decorations in the game that you can decorate the cathedral and get extra points for as you go. I love how you can kind of build up the action selection in terms of whether you're going to be delivering goods and how you manage that, the extra actions you can gain by unlocking different tokens, the way that that rondelle works, the little bit of surprise. And you cannot be 100% strategic all the time because the dice will add just that little bit of rub of randomness in there that you have to work with. I love how all of that comes together. It's got really compelling art to it as well. And I've thoroughly enjoyed this one the red cathedral my number two for 2020 okay. i really want to play this one yeah. uh, it's 
I've been yeah. forced to play solo. Yes, I said forced because I don't like playing solo. <laughs> but that one is on the pile of I might have to play that one solo to check it out. <laughs> okay. And finally, number one. <laughs> and finally, number one for me, uh, chat has mentioned this one already, and apparently this showed up on the uh, previous top ten video with Tom and the gang earlier today. That's the crew. The crew, the Search for Planet Nine, the cooperative trick-taking game uh, with multiple missions and, and ways to sort of tweak the trick-taking system. I actually taught my kids how to do trick-taking using this game. I don't necessarily recommend doing it that way uh, because there's a lot more subtlety to trick-taking in the crew. Um, but this one has the honor of being the game that my 12-year-old continually asks to play all the time and he's disappointed when the young one doesn't want to play at that particular moment so he's just constantly waiting for his chance to pick the game for game night so that he can play the crew um it is a lovely game i'm very excited to see more uh from the crew coming uh ne this next year um and uh and it's it's just a delightful game for fans of trick taking and cooperative games and both the crew number one i still haven't played it I have it. It's been sitting there, and I, I'm just itching to play it. So someone play it's it. It's on Board Game Arena Let's now. Play we'll online. make it happen. Let's okay, play online. Play online. Exactly. We're going to make this happen, because I feel like I'm left out because everyone's played it except for me. So I got to do it. <laughs> well, my number one, well, we're on the trajectory of the heavy games, and I'm so glad I got to play this, and Suzanne actually got to play it with me. Tekenu, Obelisk Tekenu. of the Sun. Uh, this is no surprise probably to anybody that I have a heavier game as my number one. Great uh, this one just really grabbed me. And I know there's another one that came out uh, recently. I don't know if it's a continuation or if it's a separate game. Suzanne, you might know a bit better than I do. Uh, no, okay, <laughs> sure. But this one is really great because you end, I love the way the dice are used in this game. So, you know, you have a, I guess it's like the area. I don't know if it's the, I'm making this like you all know what I'm talking about. It's supposed to be a tower, an obelisk in the center of the board. And you have dice in these different areas and selecting the dice will yeah, exactly determine uh, the color of the die the number on the die determines kind of the actions you can take on various areas of the board. My favorite area of the board was the building site in the upper right-hand corner. And if you've played the game, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Suzanne seemed to really favor the lower left-hand corner of the board. And I don't remember what that part was, but you were, depending on where you sat level-wise, uh, you would get uh, points. And if you had more uh, covered spaces, because it gave you bonuses and things like that. So, uh, I won't go into a long explanation because this is a heavier game, but to Kenyu Obelisk of the Sun, so good. It is slightly on the longer side, so if that's not for you, know that going into it, but uh, definitely one I think you should check out. So good. My number one is dun, 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 The Crew. <laughs> I'm so surprised. Because <laughs> I've been playing this everywhere, like if I can stream it. So what I like about The Crew for me is that um, it's very different when you're playing with different groups. I remember oh, one yeah. group, we were stuck at six. And then in another group, like, why was six hard? Six was easy. So I love that, that there are different dynamics when you're playing with other people. So no matter what, it's always fun. Even if you lose, because you're like, this is our life now. We're stuck at level 13. <laughs> have to beat this game so that's why i love it so much so the crew number one <laughs> so Excellent let me guess choice. is yours the crew too <laughs> my number one is that no okay. i'm sorry i'm <laughs> gonna have to break from the crew uh, I'm, I'm really really sorry i will play it with you anytime though because i do love the game Good. but i had to go in a different direction because i don't know maybe it's because i'm tired of being quarantined but who wouldn't want a trip to I know where Santa it's going. Monica. Ah, yes. <laughs> My number one game of 2020 right now is Santa Monica from Alderac Entertainment, uh, designed by Josh Wood. This is a kind of a card drafting, tableau building game in which the cards represent uh, the street or the beach or the boardwalk of santa monica and you're going to be drafting these cards and laying them out there's icons you are going to develop your scoring strategy as you go in terms of adjacencies and things like that 
But on top of that, they add these meeples that you can move around and you have to move them into specific areas on cards before the game. And those movement points are extremely valuable, not necessarily easy to get. And on top of that, the drafting element is very simple but really compelling where there are two rows of cards. You can take a card from the bottom row and then the top card sli slides down to fill that spot. So you can kind of plan ahead a little bit on what you want to do and plan your next move. But there's a little bit of unpredictability there as well and it just works beautifully for the game the art on this game is absolutely delightful it feels mm. so thematic every card is different with some detail all the little shops along the boardwalk the little umbrellas along the beach things like that don't be fooled by its kind of lighthearted theme and really adorable art there is a nice little thoughtful bite to the gameplay here there is a lot going on and it really does um work your brain like it's it's it is definitely a step above kind of some simpler games out there and uh, and i don't know if the art necessarily conveys that but who cares because the art is so delightful i just have fun playing santa monica it makes me happy playing happy. santa monica and you know what what could be better in 2020 than a game that makes you think that is beautiful to look at and that you have fun playing. And that is why Santa Monica is my number one game for 2020. You're missing oh, the best Christ. reason why it's the best game for you. Susan. I'm not missing anything, Eric. Oh, because well, every one of the names of these shops is a delicious pun. Which is why Suzanne <laughs> likes it so much. Look, if that, that is true, and that goes to show how good the game is, that I can remove myself from the punnery and enjoy it that much. The punnery, that sounds like a store on the boardwalk. The punnery. <laughs> Well, uh, oh, that was a fantastic list. Now, I warned you uh, not too long ago, We before we go, we should probably uh, pick one game from someone else's list that, that we now are dying to, to get to the table. And I was thinking early on in the list that Super Skill Pinball was going to be my choice. But based on the fact that all three of you put it on yours <laughs> and I have not played it, Fort... <laughs> is a game I have to get to the table. I, I have to try this out. It has, I've seen lots of praise for it. Um, and it's, it's one that totally slipped my radar. I did not even know it existed until everyone started playing it. Um, and so I, I need to give it a whirl. Uh, maybe I'll get a gift card or something and can pick up a copy. Mandy, how about you? Uh, well, I think it was pretty obvious. Red Cathedral, and I have it. I just really want to play it because I know Suzanne has spoken highly about it, about the game itself, the designers, and I think they have other games that are quite good. So uh, if I have to play it solo, I will. I don't want to, but that should tell you something if I'm going to try it solo. So Red Cathedral is going to be, I think, the next one I want to give a go. <laughs> Mine would be Viscounts. I actually had this, um, but it's very hard to play because we were in lockdown. So, But now I will be able to, and you've been raving about it, and I need to play it. I actually haven't played Paladins also. I might throw that in in the mix also. Uh, yes, you need to play all the things. All the oh, things. you'll all oh, the you'll like Paladins. Yeah. <laughs> all right, and for me, I really want to try Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. I've mm. never played Gloomhaven, and I, I'm oh. a little intimidated by it just in terms of commitment <laughs> Yeah. because it's such a massive game. And, and Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion just feels so much more approachable, both from a kind of a, a learning but just an overall experience point of view. So yeah. I... I'm really maybe I'll put that on my wish list for the holidays. Yeah. Bloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. It does look Perfect. quite good. Yeah, I agree. Mm. Very nice. So we we have a to do list basically, uh, and <laughs> yes. we have homework. Yeah. Okay. And we should probably wrap this up. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. Those of you looking at the chat and, and chatting along with us in the video feed, and those of you listening to the podcast, uh, this has been uh, a, a fun group episode. It's always fun to, to get to do one of those uh, for, for podcast listening. If you are interested in Tom's top 10 list, I guess somebody might want to know what Tom chose. Um, he uh, did a video. You can check it out as part of this uh, Winter Spectacular. And I imagine he might pop in uh, to give his top 10 perhaps next week when he and I are in the podcast chair once again. Uh, but until then... I'm Eric Summer. I'm Mandy Hutchinson. I'm Ella Ampongan. And I'm Suzanne Sheldon. 
and you've been watching and listening to the Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode, number 689, was recorded on December 16th, 2020. Tom, Suzanne, and I join you next week to talk about our favorite family games of the year. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. If a catastrophic event has become more than you can handle, find out how we can help at jackvassal.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Mandy, Suzanne, and Eric, with assistance from Rob Searing, Mike Delicio, and Roy Kennedy. The one where Ross's sister has to deliver all the presents, provided by Santa Monica. Timothy Pinkham composed our theme, and you can get the latest on everything Dice Tower at dicetower.com. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Mandy at DiceTower.com, Suzanne at DiceTower.com, or Eric at DiceTower.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network, including Board with Video Games, Meeple Overboard, Solosaurus, Flip Flory's Super Saturday Board Game Serial, Every Night is Game Night, Our Turn, Board Game Blitz, and Dice Tower Tonight. Find your next favorite at DiceTowerNetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming.